Do you know what's actually coming out of a blaster when someone pulls the trigger? If you said laser beams, you're dead wrong. And here's the crazy part. Even hardcore Star Wars fans get this completely backwards. What you're seeing isn't light at all. It's something far more dangerous and way more interesting. By the end of this video, you'll know exactly what every blaster bolt is made of, why different factions use different colors, and how this technology actually works. Trust me. Once you learn this, you'll never watch a blaster fight the same way again. Blasters operate on a principle that's both elegant and brutal. Energy-rich gases get stored in pressurized cartridges, then fed into a conversion chamber, where a power pack excites the gas molecules to extreme temperatures. This creates a plasma state, matter so energized that electrons separate from their atoms entirely. The plasma then gets focused through an actuating module that converts this chaotic energy into a coherent particle beam. A focusing crystal shapes the final bolt, determining its accuracy and penetration power. What exits the barrel isn't light traveling at light speed. It's a concentrated packet of superheated matter moving at roughly 130 miles per hour. This explains why Jedi can deflect blaster bolts with lightsabers. You can't deflect light, that would be physically impossible, but you can redirect a stream of charged particles using an electromagnetic field, which is exactly what a lightsaber's plasma blade generates. Tabana gas became the foundation of galactic warfare, but not because it was the most powerful option available. The galaxy had access to dozens of exotic gases. Sig gas, with its armor-piercing capabilities. Eliton gas, favored by elite forces, like Cassian Andor, who carried eight compressed ampules in his belt. And Prothium gas, used in specialized military applications. Tabana won because it struck the perfect balance between cost, availability, and effectiveness. A single gas cartridge could produce 500 shots while the power pack that energized them would drain after just 100 rounds. This created an entire economy around gas mining and distribution. Cloud City wasn't just a luxury resort floating in Bespin's atmosphere. It was a massive industrial operation, processing Tybana gas for weapons across multiple sectors. When the Empire occupied Bespin, they weren't interested in the city's casinos. They wanted control of a resource that could supply blaster ammunition to entire star fleets. The Tabana gas processed in Cloud City wasn't just valuable. It was the lifeblood of blasters everywhere, shaping the colors and costs of war itself. Red blaster bolts ruled the galaxy's battlefields. Why? Because they were cheap. If you were a rebel, you didn't fire red by choice. You fired red because that's all you could afford. Credits were tight, resources were tighter, even Imperial stormtroopers used red bolts. The Empire had deep pockets but shallow aim. And honestly, they probably figured, why waste good ammo if you're not hitting anything anyway? Now, green bolts. That was a different story. They cost a lot more. The Imperial Navy used them to show off its wealth and power. Every green beam from a TIE fighter or Star Destroyer screamed. We own the skies. Even Naboo's royal guard fired green. Queen Amidala didn't cut corners on safety. Her guards carried CR2 blasters that could switch modes, standard fire, or a shocking stun blast for close combat. But then came the blue bolts. And that changed everything. You probably noticed Republic troops firing blue during the Clone Wars. That wasn't style. Ionized gas hit droids harder frying circuits before they could even raise a blaster. These weren't just pretty colors. They were battlefield decisions. Each one told you who had money, who had tech, and who was desperate. Later, when the resistance rose, they fired blue too. Not because it was better, but because it was leftover. Hand-me-down gas from the previous generation. Blue marked the old fight. But another color, far rarer, held a power no army could ignore. Purple blaster bolts are the rarest in the galaxy, and here's why that matters to you. These bolts pack nearly twice the punch of red ones. The science is simple, purple light carries twice the energy than red light. But here's what's crazy. Only a few alien species ever figured out how to make them work. The Geonosians were first. 
you saw their purple bolts rip through Republic ships at the Battle of Geonosis. Their secret? Alien tech that most species couldn't copy. Those bug-like fighters had laser cannons that spun around using super magnets. When they fired, Purple Death came out. Republic gunships didn't stand a chance. Want to know how powerful we're talking about? Gaming records show Purple Bolts did 36 damage. Red Bolts? Only 18. That's double the destruction in your hands. But wait, it gets better. The Techno Union took Purple Energy even further. Wat Tambor's droids fired purple beams that exploded and electrocuted targets. His decimator weapon shot purple lightning tentacles that hunted down enemies. Think about that. Lightning that chases you. So why don't you see purple blasters everywhere? The gas is impossible to find. Geonosians mined special compounds from asteroid belts. The Techno Union used methane from three different moons. These resources were locked down tight. Only the richest factions could afford purple blaster tech. Everyone else? They got stuck with basic red bolts. That's the real reason purple blasters stayed rare. Not because they didn't work, because nobody else could make them. Orange bolts indicated training ammunition, low-powered charges that could sting without causing permanent damage. Luke's training remote on the Millennium Falcon fired orange bolts, as did the combat simulators used by clone cadets on Kamino. The Bad Batch encountered cyan-colored training bolts in Topoka City's facilities, representing an even lower-powered variant designed for safe practice. Yellow bolts appeared primarily in Mandalorian weapons, particularly those used by Death Watch. The gas likely came from deposits found on Mandalore's Moon Concordia, where Death Watch operated in exile. These bolts may have been specifically engineered to penetrate Beskar armor, giving Mandalorians an edge in their civil conflicts. Imperial training facilities also used yellow bolts, though these were lower-powered versions for safe practice sessions. Stun settings produced distinctive blue rings that could overload a target's nervous system for up to 10 minutes. Every blaster included multiple power settings that transformed the same weapon into different tools. Maximum power settings could vaporize most materials entirely. Though this drained power packs rapidly and often led to overheating issues. The DC-15A rifle used by clone troopers could engage targets up to five kilometers away when properly mounted. While the compact E-11 blaster rifle favored by stormtroopers topped out at just 300 meters. This trade-off between size and range shaped tactical doctrines across the galaxy. Separatist E-5 blaster rifles achieved the highest rate of fire among non-repeating weapons, though this speed often led to overheating problems, while the Rebel Alliance's A-280 found the optimal balance between power and reliability, making it a favorite among infantry units operating with limited maintenance support. Speed and power won battles, but gas? Gas decided empires. Blaster gas wasn't just ammunition, it was power. The Empire knew this. They grabbed control of every gas mine they could find. Rebels couldn't get the good stuff. That was the point. Here's how desperate things got. Rebel fleets launched fake attacks just to steal gas shipments. Entire battles were fought as distractions. While you were watching the fireworks, Rebels were raiding supply convoys. But some gases were worth more than gold. Sig gas could punch through any armor. The Republic was so scared of it, they created a whole government office just to track it. The Bureau of Sig, Spice, and Slavery. Think about that name for a second. Gas was listed right next to slavery as a major threat. Want to know the crazy economics behind this? A single blaster gas cartridge gave you 500 shots. Cost? The price of a decent meal. Compare that to old school bullets. 500 rounds would bankrupt most soldiers. This is why blasters took over the galaxy. Not because they were cooler, not because they were more accurate, because they were cheap to feed once you had the gas. The Empire controlled the gas, they controlled the war. Simple as that. Every shot a rebel fired was a victory against their supply chain. Every empty cartridge was a reminder of who really held the power in the galaxy. Some weapon makers tried something crazy. They used kyber crystals in blasters. You know kyber crystals. 
they power lightsabers, but what if you put them in guns? The results were wild. These weapons shot tighter beams that punched through anything. But here's the problem. Most of them blew up. Kyber crystals and blaster tech don't play nice together. But some manufacturers got creative with hybrid weapons. Take Zeb's bow rifle, you've seen him use it. One second it's shooting red bolts. The next second it's an electric staff with 11,000 volts running through it. That's enough electricity to fry a stormtrooper's armor. And the trooper inside, Agent Callus, had a yellow version. Same deadly combo. Shoot you or shock you, your choice. Wanna know what else changed the game? Safety features became standard. Every blaster got serial numbers and safety switches. No more accidental shots taking out your squad mates. Advanced models could boost their firepower with special doublers. Some even had triplers. But here's the catch. They drained power like crazy. You could triple your damage output. But your battery would die three times faster. Most soldiers stuck with standard power. Better to have 500 reliable shots than 150 super shots and a dead weapon. Smart thinking in a galaxy where running out of ammo meant running out of life. From the ancient Rakata who first developed the technology to the modern era of galactic civil war, blaster technology evolved far beyond simple energy weapons. It shaped economies, influenced military strategies, and became deeply woven into the fabric of galactic society. Each faction's choice of gas and weapon configuration became part of their identity. Mandalorians with their distinctive yellow bolts, clone armies with their tactical blue charges, and Imperial forces with their premium green beams. Every color told a story about resources, priorities, and battlefield doctrine. The diversity of blaster technology reflected the complexity of the galaxy itself. What appeared to be simple laser weapons were actually sophisticated systems that converted raw materials into focused destruction. Powered by an intricate web of mining operations, manufacturing facilities, and distribution networks that connected every corner of known space. Understanding blaster technology means understanding how the Star Wars galaxy actually functions. Not through the mystical force or ancient prophecies, but through the practical realities of physics, economics, and engineering that make galactic civilization possible. So what do you think? Are there any rare blaster colors or weapons I missed? Have you spotted purple bolts in other Star Wars content that didn't make it into this breakdown? Drop your thoughts in the comments below and let me know what blaster technology you'd want to see covered next. And if this deep dive into Star Wars weapons tech was worth your time, smash that like button and subscribe for more breakdowns that go way deeper than surface level. There's a whole galaxy of technology waiting to be explained, and we're just getting started. Thanks for watching, and may your blaster bolts always find their mark.